welcome in, welcome in, guys. Welcome in. God bless you guys. God bless, God bless. Make sure you hit top of the screen, share the live, guys. Tap the screen and share the live. We're going to be talking about the seven IMs, but I'm going to talk about one of them today. What's up, bro? Make sharing the live, guys. Get some people up in here. We're going to talk about I am the bread of life, right? In John chapter 6, he mentions seven I am's. And I'm going to start a teaching on this. Today's going to be the I am the bread of life. So we're going to break that down today. So welcome in. God bless you guys. God bless you. Another factality. Welcome in. God bless you. Orthodox, welcome. What's up, Mama Vicky? What's up? I'm going to give people a little bit of time to get in here. And then we'll get started. And I'm going to have Brother uh, Key read scripture for me because I am traveling and that would be kind of dangerous. Good afternoon, everybody. So while we're waiting for some people to get in here, how is everybody doing? How is everybody doing? Uh, what's up, Dustin? Welcome in. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you guys for liking it. Good evening. Good evening. Does everybody understand? Does everybody know the seven I am's that Jesus says? Does everybody know the seven I am's? Practicing being slow to speak. Amen. Amen. I think we all need to practice on that. What's up, Shelly? Amen. One of the things that uh, 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 another factality, one of the things that I've learned with practicing being slow to speak is we give God an opportunity to give us the understanding of what's being heard. So it's it's one of those things where, well, uh, like if somebody says something, it's like, okay, let me pause and wait for the Holy Spirit to give me understanding before I respond. Versus just immediately responding to what I've heard. Bro, you know what I just found out? What's that? The host can mute their microphone. Oh, uh, praise God. This is going to be amazing. Amazing, amazing. Well, it's not too amazing because I still got to do the teaching. So you guys got to deal with the background noise. I don't know what to tell you there. Make sure you top and share the live, guys, and then we're going to get started here in about, I'm going to say five minutes we'll get started. Um, and we're going to be talking about the first I am, which is I am the bread of life. Amen. I am the bread of life. Let me share this live out. I can figure out how to do this. Man, it's really bumpy. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. We're going to be in John chapter 6. John chapter 6.
John chapter 6. There's so much in John chapter 6 to unpack. You could be in John chapter 6 for half a year, bro. Goodness. Alright. You want to go ahead and open us in prayer and then read uh, John 6, 26 through 59? And I'll mute out. 626 through 59? Yes, sir. Here, so. Heavenly Father, we thank you right now that you've allowed us to come to you again this day, this day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for your grace, your mercies, your new mercies, which are created anew every day. We thank you, Father, that you love us and we love you only because you first loved us. We thank you right now for the opportunity again to break bread along, uh, among the brethren and we ask that the Holy Spirit will come in and we will quiet our spirits and hear what you have to say to the church. Father, if there be a non-believer in here, Father, that you will prick their heart, that they may come to the place to accept your son, Jesus Christ, as the Lord and Savior. We thank you right now. We ask that you remove all distractions, everything that has come to set itself against all that you de desire to do this day, Father. We ask that you will... We'll cast it down in the name of Jesus, and we believe in your word. No weapon formed against us shall prosper, and every tongue that rises up against us in judgment, thou shalt condemn. We thank you, Father. We thank you. We give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so John chapter 6, starting at verse 26. All right, all right, all right, all right. And behold, he speaks publicly and say nothing to him. Let me make sure. One second. Let me just go to my, my other Bible for the sake of clarity. Matthew. Because this is six. Okay, 26. All right, here we go. Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly, I say to you, seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves. <clears throat> Hold on. You seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the son of man will give you, give to you for on him, the father God has set his seal. Therefore, they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work with the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly, I say, say you, <clears throat> I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread of heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will no longer hunger, would not hunger. And he who believes in me would never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me or the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my father, that everyone who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. Therefore, the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph? Who father and mother we know? How does he say, 
I have come down out of heaven. Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. No man can, no man can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets and they shall be all and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews begin to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I, be, I live because of the Father. So he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Amen, amen, the word of the Lord, right? So today we're going to start a series. I'm going to teach a series. And the series is going to be on the seven I am's, right? Um, the seven I am's are the saying in, God, in John's gospel. I am the bread of life, number one. I am the light of the world, right? I am the door, gate of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. See, these seven vivid sayings all indicate that Jesus is somehow making God present. He is speaking as God. See, in the Old Testament, God identifies himself as I am who I am. And that's in Exodus 3.14. In these sayings, Jesus is saying, I too am the God who is I am who I am. Thus, if we want bread, that is spiritual food, right, that lasts forever, we are to come to Jesus to be fed. If we want light to find our way in the dark world, then Jesus is that light. If we want to find the way to God, we come to Jesus, who is the way to heaven. And the gate at the end, right? If we want to rise to new life after death, then only Jesus can give us this gift. If we want to care and protection along life's way, then Jesus offers this as the Good Shepherd. And if we want to know the presence of God in our life, then we need to abide in Jesus, the true vine. Now today we're going to be talking about, I am the bread of life. Amen? So when I think of bread, I really think about when my mom makes banana nut bread, right? I love banana nut bread. So I, when I think of bread, I picture this. I, I can smell it. I can taste it. I picture the ingredients going in the bowl. I picture all of it coming together and making this loaf that we have that we can eat, right? And that's a lot of what is in the Western affluent society is a special treat that is added to our very rich diet, right? And we might miss it, but if we can get on fine without it, it's okay. But one thing about the bread of life, the true bread of life, is something that we cannot get around and get on without. Now, in contrast to the Western civilization in which we live in right now, the Mediterranean world of, of Jesus' day, bread was the most important and basic part of their diet. If you had bread and water or a little wine, you had a meal, right? 
If you have an addition of some fish or some red meat, a slice of cheese or some few dates, you ate very, very well. You had a full course meal at that point in those times. You see, the grains of the Middle East, mainly wheat and barley, were used to make this bread. In the East, rice is the equivalent and it could be eaten simply by boiling it. When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, when Jesus said, I am the bread of life, are we bros? No, we good, bro. Because okay. people in the chat are saying we're froze. Is it just froze for Helen or is it froze for everybody? Wait and see. They did this the other day, too. It's good on my end. All right, let's go. So rice is the equivalent. It can be eaten simply by boiling it, right? So when Jesus said, I am the bread of life, he's not saying I'm like a freshly baked loaf from Baker's Delight with sesame seeds on top, right? But I am what you need to live. I am the only one who can really nourish you with a long life journey, okay? I am really the only one that can nourish you on your, your, your life's journey. Now let's get into a little bit of Old Testament background so we can understand what's taking place, okay? When Jesus spoke of himself as the bread of life, his Jewish hearers would have immediately thought of Moses, and we've seen this in the text that we read, right? So they would immediately thought of Moses who fed the Israelites in the wilderness with bread so it's not surprising that someone in the crowd called out our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness and as, as it is written he gave them bread right we see that in John 6 31 in reply Jesus said this he says I am that bread of life I am that bread of life and, and you may revere Moses, but I offer you something that Moses could never have offered you. I give you something that Moses never even had the control of. I give you something that Moses didn't have the power to bring to you. Because in the scripture he said, Moses gave it to you, but who provided it? He said, Moses may have given it to you, but my father is the one that provided so Jesus says, I am that bread of life, right? Now Jesus went on here in John 6 and he says, I don't give you a bread that spoils. I don't give you a bread that, that, that decays. I don't give you a bread that only feeds the body. I don't give you just a bread that satisfies for a moment. He says, I give you the bread that offers eternal life. I give you the bread that brings you peace. I give you the bread that brings you joy. I give you the bread that brings you comfort. I give you the bread that brings you into communion with me. Come on, somebody. I give you the bread that brings life, not only to the fulfillment of the body, but to the fulfillment of the soul. Hallelujah. He's saying, I surpass Moses. Moses ain't got nothing on me, right? Moses don't have nothing on me. Moses brought what my father gave. I bring you something that Moses never had the opportunity to receive. Amen. So even that bread was a foreshadow of the greater bread that was to come. Amen. Amen. And Pastor Nick, you can jump in if you want, brother. God bless you. So all the gospel, when we begin to look at the context of John chapter 6, all the gospels tell of Jesus feeding the 5,000 with five barley loaves and two fish. But only John, only the book of John, only the gospel of John 
has a long account of what took place subsequent to this and what Jesus said by way of explanation. John tells us the next day a large crowd again came to Jesus and this time Jesus castigated them, right? Saying that they had only come hoping to be fed again. Can you read this for me, brother? Can you go to John 6, 22 to 34? I want them to see this. John 6? Yes, 22 to 34. All right, John 6, 22, 34. On the morrow, the crowd standing on the other side of the sea had seen that no other little boat was there except one. That one into which his disciples entered and that Jesus did not go with his disciples into that little boat, but that the disciples went away alone but other small boats came from Ty, Tiberias near the place where they ate the bread. The Lord having given thanks. Therefore, when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves also entered into the boats and came to Cap Capernaum. Capernaum, I'm sorry, I always have trouble with that word. Seeking Jesus and finding him across the sea. They said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw miracles, but because you ate the loaves and were satisfied. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to, to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for God the Father sealed this one. Then they said to him, what may we do that we may work for we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe into him whom that one sent. That they said to him, <clears throat> then they said to him, Hold on. Okay, then they said to him, Then what miracle do you do that we may see and may believe you? What do you work? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Moses has not given you the bread out of heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is the one coming down out of the heaven and giving life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Amen, the word of the Lord. So we see they came back, right? They came seeking food. They came hoping that they could be fed again. They came looking to fill their gut rather than their soul, rather than their spirit. And he said what they should do is seek after the true bread from heaven, right? They, they should seek after the true bread from heaven, the bread that gives life to the world. And the, the crowd took Jesus' words literally. They took these words literally. They want as much of this bread as they can have, so they cry out, Give us this bread always. Give us this bread always. And Jesus, he looks at them. And I love to picture these things in my mind. I can see Jesus looking at this crowd. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He says, I am that bread that you're looking for. I am that, that, that fullness that you want inside of you. I am that bread in which the Father has sent. He said, whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. It's so clear here that Jesus is speaking metaphorically. That is pictorially, right? The bread that Jesus is offering 
gives eternal life and it quenches the spiritual thirst. It doesn't relieve that physical hunger. It doesn't relieve that physical thirst. But the spiritual hunger, the spiritual thirst is satisfied. It's full. It's quenched. And the coming to Jesus for this bread is not a literal coming as one might come to a shop that sells bread. But it involves the belief. It involves believing. It involves an action. You see, coming to Jesus to find eternal life and salvation is the declaration of hope which turns into the faith that allows us to believe and receive that fullness into our spirit, into our soul. No, Jesus does not say come to church every week and you'll get the bread of life. Or working for the poor and needy will earn you the bread of life. Or even believing in God will give you the bread of life. He says, I am the bread of life. And he gives this bread of life to those who believe in him. That is those who recognize that in Jesus, that in Jesus, God is at work to save. And by trusting in him, you receive this bread. What this comment brings to our attention is that in this, in this I am saying, and all the others, Jesus is the focus. He is the focal point here. Jesus is the good news. He is the one who offers the bread that truly satisfies. He is the one that lights our way in this dark world. He is the gate to the eternal life. He is the good shepherd. He is the true vine. In the sixth of these I am's, in the sixth of these I am's, Jesus' focus cannot be missed. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. We have to begin to get our priorities straight here. At first thought, we ask ourselves, how did the Jews miss the point when Jesus has spoken bread that truly satisfies? Why did they first think of ordinary bread? The answer is because they're just like each and every one of us. They're just like you. They're just like me. The material rewards of life were more pressing and attractive than the spiritual rewards were. What they wanted was an unending supply of bread that could make their daily life easier. How many of you today are looking for things to make your life easier rather than having the eternal security. How many of you are looking to fill the natural things rather than the spiritual things? How many of you are so focused on the things of the world rather than the things of the kingdom? Imagine this for just one moment. One night in a dream, we heard Jesus say to us, I have a wonderful gift for you. I have a wonderful gift for you. I bet a lot of us today would say, well, how much money are you giving me? How much money are you giving me? Or is it a, is it a new car? Or is it a promotion at your job? 
or is it a release of a physical burden? All of us have something that we've been asking God to take away from us. We've been asking God to release us from. That we've been asking God, you know, God, just take this. God, I need this. God, I, 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 I want this. We so easily count our blessings in material terms rather than salvational terms. Oh, speak tonight, Lord. We count our blessings in material terms and not in salvational terms, spiritual terms. Everything we are and have is a gift from God. See, when we begin to realize that everything originates from God and returns to God, we begin to show the humility that it was all God's to begin with. We see the sovereignty of Him. That includes our material blessings. The material is not evil. However, Jesus is teaching constantly reminds us that there is something more important than money. There's something more important than homes. There's something more important than cars. There's something more important than family. There's something more important than holidays. There's something more important than these materialistic things. It's a relationship with the God revealed in Jesus Christ and it's made present through the Holy Spirit if we want life in all of its fullness if we want life in all of its fullness then we need most of all the bread that Jesus alone can give. We need the bread of life. When he said, I am the bread of life, that's the life that we need. That's the nourishment that we need. That's the fulfillment that we need. He said, the bread that, that others can give you, you'll want more of because the fulfillment is not there. The things that the world can provide will tarnish, will fade away. The bread that you're seeking in the world will only satisfy for a moment. But the bread that I am, the bread that I bring, you'll never hunger or thirst again. Only this can sustain us along life's journey. Only this can sustain us along life's journey and prepare us for the life to come. When we begin to look at these I am's, we have to recognize what he's saying. We have to recognize why he said it. When I finally realized that the bread I was looking for was the relationship with Christ, the fulfillment in life was given. See, I used to chase the women. I used to chase the money. I used to chase the cars. I used to chase for the new houses. I used to chase for the best watch. I used to chase the best shoes. I used to chase for the best outfit. But see, when those things begin to disappear, when they begin to be taken from you, when the things begin to be...
bread of life can step in. Only the bread of life is the fulfillment. Only the bread of life can satisfy that void that's in you. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He's saying, I am the only sustaining force that you need. He says, I am your sustainer. I am your food. I am your nourishment. Remember in John where we read it, he says that if you eat of my body, ooh, if you eat of my body, do you guys understand what he's saying here? See, the Catholics believe that it's a literal body that he's talking about. They believe the Eucharist becomes the body of flesh. Can you read John 114, Brother Key? Let's see what this body is. Yes, sir. John 114. And the word became flesh and the tabernacle among us. Hold on. Okay. And the word became flesh and the tabernacle among us. And we beheld his glory, glory as of an only begotten from the Father, full of grace and the truth. When we look at what he's saying about eating of the flesh, he's talking about indulging in his word, indulging in every bit of his word. How do you get closer? You get closer by being in the relationship with him. How do you get in that relationship through his word? The indulging of him, of who he is, of what he's about. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. The indulging of his word. I want you to listen to Jesus one last time. He says in John 6, 27, he says this. He says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Are you tired of being hungry? Are you tired of having an emptiness inside of you? Are you tired of feeling a void? Are you tired of seeking the material things and not feeling the contentment? Are you tired of, of seeking things of the world that are leaving you hopeless? Are you ready to be filled with hope? Are you ready to be filled with joy? Are you ready to be content in your walk? Are you ready to see the fullness in the satisfaction of what God has to offer you? It's so simple. It's right here in front of you. He says, I am the bread of life. He's making a statement right here. Remember, Jesus said, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. He's saying, Moses gave you bread, but Moses didn't have the bread in which I have because the bread that Moses gave you, you were still hungry. You weren't content. You weren't full. But I'm telling you that the bread that I am is the fullness of everything you need. He says you'll no longer be hungry. You'll no longer thirst. I am that fullness. I am that contentness. I am that satisfier. I am who I say I am. As we go on with these seven I am's, I really want you guys to understand what he's saying. He's saying he is the fulfillment in all things and we'll see this as we progress. Amen. We really, we really <laughs> gotta grasp this here. Go ahead, and brother. I'm, I'm I'm looking at, uh, as you were speaking, I see a tug of war going on. And the tug of war is, is us trying to, to say, okay, God, I'm, I'm gonna study your word, I'm gonna read your word, but it's based on me hoping that eventually 
you got a bunch of materialistic stuff to give me. So the basis of me reading and studying in your word, it's not that I really may grow in you and learn more of your son and, and to do what you called me to do in the earth, but it's, it's based on me hoping I can get all of these material things. And so Amen. since the foundation isn't what it needs to be, when, when the storms of life come, because we're not rooted on the rock of Christ, we <laughs> come down with a great crash. We look at the story where Jesus said, come and follow me. And the one man said, well, you know, I got ox. I, got, I just got a new pair of ox. Well, I can't come follow you because I got this. The word of God says that those who put their hands to the plow and look back are not fit for the kingdom. Anybody that's coming to salvation or coming to Jesus with the hope <laughs> that he is the blueprint to fulfill all your wild fantasies and dreams, you're in the wrong place. You're in the wrong place because it makes it easy for the person to take the mark of the beast. It, it makes it easy for a person to sell out or saying, hey, I will give you this. It makes it easy, just like it was easy, just like Satan had Miguel Eve in the garden. Because her desires wasn't to obey God. Her desires was to become, you know, full of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding like God. So if our desires are for the world and the things of the world and material things and not for the things of God, we're in trouble. What happens when God says, listen, I'm going to take away your job, but I'm going to provide for you. I need you to go into full-time ministry. Can we really bear the weight of that and say, you know what? For Christ I live, for Christ I die, I trust that God is going to provide for me everything that's needed. Or do we say, man, how in the world am I going to buy this, 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 and this? How am I going to fund my life when it comes to the pleasures thereof? We got to be willing to sacrifice everything, and we must sacrifice everything when we come to Christ. There is no holding on of the world and holding on to the king. It don't work that way. Amen. Amen. Amen, brother. What's up, Pastor Nick? I know you want to add, so dive on in, bro. Uh, um, I, I really think this is one of the most important passages in the New Testament. Uh, a lot of people, when you read this passage of Scripture, John chapter 6, this whole passage of Scripture is, is, is Jesus telling them that, uh, informing the Jews that, you know, their fathers ate, ate manna in the wilderness. He's, now he's saying the true manna has come. The true manna from heaven, the true bread has come, and he was your he was the the natural bread sustained your 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 forefathers in the wilderness, but he's saying this bread that I bring is going to uh, give you eternal life, and so he begins to talk about this past. This passage is powerful because in this passage you're going to see people who are truly faced with the truth. Uh, it's not about what what God can do for you. Now it's going to come to the point where it's, it's whether you're willing to accept him or not. And so the passage that I really love to see, because he, he gives them, he, he lays it out on the line. And when you get down to 53 and, and Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat of this flesh, of the, eat of the flesh of the son of man and drink of his blood. You have no life in you. He says, whoever eats eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. He says, and I will raise him up in the last day. See, this is the key. Uh, we, we talk about him earlier being uh, the resurrection and the life. This lines up right there with, with, with that as well when you look at this text. And so he's saying that, that you must take of him. You must take him in. Uh, he told the woman at the well. He says, if you drink of this, 
the water that I'm going to give you is water springing up into everlasting life. What Jesus is talking about is abiding in him, becoming one with him. And so then he said, because whatever you take in, you become one with. And so he says here, he says, for my flesh, he says, for verse 55, he says, for my flesh is food indeed, and, and, and my blood is drink indeed. He says, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. Do you see that connection right there? This is powerful in this text. And, and I want you to, uh, it, he's drawing the picture and he's making it very clear that, that you must take of me. And not of not of natural bread. I'm the I'm the spiritual bread. And then here he says, uh, he says, and I in him. He says, as the as the living Father sent me. He says, and I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. So here he's talking about life. He's the bread of life. This is powerful. He says, this is the bread which came down from heaven. Now, when you look at the manna, every when you study that in the Old Testament, that manna that came down from heaven, they ate of it every day except one day of the week during the Passover. And they had this they 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 had the which which sustained them for 2 days for for the, you know from from that next day to the next day. Uh and that day they weren't supposed to go out and pick it. But he's giving them a different analogy. He's saying, "I am the bread." That came. your fathers ate it in the wilderness. I'm going to give you this bread that you'll never. You don't have to go out and pick it no more. All you have to do is take it in, and this spiritual bread it springs up into everlasting life. And so he says, "This is the bread which comes down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the ate manna in the wilderness and are dead." See, he makes that analogy that those who ate the natural they die. He says. They died in the wilderness. But look what he says. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in their synagogue as he taught them in Capernaum. Now, this is the problem, Pastor Nate. I want you to see it because this was the turning point in Jesus's ministry. If, if, you, if you notice this, that, that's why uh, John chapter six is paramount. Because he draws the line in the sand here. And then he says, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And, and, and I want you to see this. And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if I should say, what then should you say? Say, if you see the son of man ascending where he is, where, where he was before. In other words, he says, he says, OK, you're having a hard set. You're having a problem with this. I'm telling you, I'm revealing to you who I really am. And then he says, what if you see the son of man ascending, going back up to uh, to where he originally was? Would you believe that? Because that happens in Acts chapter one. This is powerful, y'all. And then he says, here, then he says here, he says, uh, uh, he says, uh, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. So he's drawing the line. He's letting them know that he is the spiritual bread from heaven. The words which I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Now he's talking to disciples. See, this is a, this is, uh, even for us today, when we study this, because there are a lot of people, especially in our Western culture, that say we follow Christ. We're blessed. We blessed because we have houses and cars and all that. Well, suppose Jesus say, OK, I'm not giving you none of that anymore. All I'm telling you is you must accept me. Will you just accept God if you don't have these so-called blessings? Because when you look at the beautitude, God never talked about having stuff. He, he talks about blessed are they who, who mourn, blessed are they who, who are persecuted for righteousness, blessed are they, you know, he gives the whole blessed, the, the beauty to, but he never talks about material gain. In our culture, we talk about money. Now, Jesus is saying, no, you must just have me. And so in this text, when he said, 
And he said, verse 65, he says, he says, uh, then before I say to you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to them by my father. So there are some people that's going to have problems coming to Jesus. They're going to have problems because when it's just him, no, no additives, no preservatives, no houses, no cars, no provision, no food for your natural belly. Will you be willing to accept him then? He's telling he's telling his disciples. Now, the sad part of this story, when you keep reading it, he says, from that time on, verse 66, when Jesus drew the line in the sand, he says, no more stuff. I'm not doing no more miracles right now. Are you willing to eat of me? Are you willing to take of me? Verse 66, from that time, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They followed him no more. A lot of people don't study that. They left Jesus. When Jesus said, it, it must be just me, they left him. I, I, I would like to see the modern day American church when, when they, uh, if Jesus say, no more blessings, no more houses, no more land. Let's go to a third world country, a third world country where the gospel is just being preached. And, and you have a choice to just accept Jesus. You're not getting no Lexus or no Cadillac or no big house or no, I'm talking about just the pure gospel. Will you just accept him? This is the line in the sand. And it says, from that point on, many went back and walked with him no more. And Jesus said to, to his 12, do you want to leave as well? Do you want to leave? Do you want to go away as well? Now, I want you to hear the words of Peter. But Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? In other words, Peter is like, Lord, I know too much now. I know who you are. He says, well, shall we go? He says, you have the words. Here it is. You have the words of eternal life. See, if you start loving eternal life more than you love temporal life, then you have a, a clue to the kingdom of God. Then you have a clue to who Jesus is. And so he says, also, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I would like the American culture to really grab hold of this and truly get an understanding of what Jesus is saying in this text. Because whenever we get caught up in prosperity and all of these false doctrines that are out here today, the question is, Pastor Nate, will we just accept him? That's well, that's know, brother, the, that's how important. You, you know what what's amazing is no because you can see it today. Well, I haven't experienced God. I haven't seen God. I'm not seeing this. I'm not seeing that. How can I believe in something I can't see? It's the same as the disciples were in that day when he said he was going to stop doing these great things. They turned and went away. Right? They turned and went away. It's the same thing that's happening today, brother. Amen. Pa Pastor Nate, they turned and went away when he when he drew the line in the sand and told them it's it's no more bread, no more natural bread. I am the bread. Now, are you willing to accept just me? That's the line. Uh, and when they when he drew it out in verses 55 all the way to verse 59, when he drew that out for them. Now they had a decision to make. And they said, this is a hard thing. This is a hard thing to accept. See, we when we put that, when we put this passage in context, it they can't it came to the point where are you willing just to accept him without natural bread, without cars, houses, land? Will you just accept him and take him in? That's when the line is drawn in the sand. Amen. That's when the line is drawn in the sand. And, and when it came to that, no more stuff, just me. And this is what the modern church today, it breaks my heart. But when the modern church, the Bible says, when it, it says a man don't work, he doesn't eat. The first thing that he gave man was work. If you study the, new, the Old Testament, Genesis. The first thing that God has gave man was work. Every day that you live on this Till planet, my garden. you're supposed to, Till my that, that's garden. right. You took
you're supposed to get up and you're supposed to work. So as far as your natural needs being supplied, God promises that he shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. This is the whole discourse in, in Matthew uh, when he starts telling you, uh, consider the lilies of the field. They, know, they don't work the birds. They don't work. In other words, God will supply your needs. But in American culture, they say that you blessed is having more stuff. Blessed, no, blessed is having Jesus. Blessed is having seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's blessed. Uh, can, can you all hear me, Pastor Nate? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Amen. Right. So, so that's what blessed is, seeking first. What is the kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace. Joy in the Holy Ghost. That's righteousness. And how do we get the kingdom of God? We, we must first partake of the uh, of, of Christ. And so this is powerful, Pastor Nate, because what's happening is, is Jesus is in this chapter, one of the most powerful chapters in the New Testament. He's drawing the line. And if American culture grabs a hold of this, which uh, which which I don't know if the majority of the modern day ch church is too far gone because all we talk about is material blessings on, in, in the world that we live in. We, we have people nowadays that are not even preaching Jesus. They're not even preaching the gospel. They're saying Jesus loves me and, he, and we're blessed because we have stuff. And so this right here, chapter six of, of, of John, Chapter six of John is powerful. Matthew six, verse 33, he tells us to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things shall be added unto us. Matthew six, 33. So what is, what is called being blessed? Our world is, we, we have lost perspective of what Christianity is. And this chapter right here, if people really study it and, and look at it for what it's saying, I'm telling you, man, it, it'll change your whole walk because Jesus is drawing the line saying, is it me or are you seeking me for stuff? All I'm giving you is me. And, and the question is, Pastor Nate, is Jesus enough for you? Is Amen. Jesus enough for us? That's the question. Amen. Amen. And you know, a lot of people, you know, they miss what the two fish and the five loaves represent. Let, let, let me let me enlighten you guys just a little bit. I don't know if you know it or not, but a lot of people miss this. Okay. The number two speaks of unity. Okay. The number two speaks of unity. And the number five is the number of grace. So when we come into unity with the Lord and experience His grace, we are filled and have more than enough. So in this context that Jesus describes that He is the bread of life, we see that when we come into unity with Him, we experience the fullness of God. We experience the fullness of the grace that he has for each and every one of us. What do you guys think, uh, Minister Kim, Brother uh, Pastor Nick? I, I definitely believe that to be, definitely believe that to be so. And that, there's some parallels that were drawn when uh, Nick was speaking and when you were speaking. Uh, and, and the first parallel I got, parallel I got was with Judas. Judas followed Jesus, <laughs> saw all that he saw. And it was in the end, it was for things. It was for money. You know what I'm saying? And and we see that what happened in the end, you know, of his life, there was already uh, already uh established before the foundations of the world what he was built up for. We realized that, man, even when the they the, the lady came with the alabaster box, he put forth his own lust. And like, man, we could have sold that and gave too. No, you know you didn't want to sell that to give, you know, to help nobody in need. You thought about your own lustful desires. You thought about your own greed. And and there are people now, you know what I'm saying, that we simply following, like Nick said, you could you give up everything? You know what I'm saying? And I and I sit here 
and there's some days I think I'd be tripping, y'all. But but y'all, you know, Nick and and and, and Nate, y'all brought it home. I think I'd be tripping. I would sit here, yo, and be so engulfed with the word of God. Like I would grab a a a, a handful of the word and just feel like I can just eat the pages, yo. Like seriously, like if I could just if I could just bite into the Bible, and I'm like, yo, what is this? But it it shows me, you know, it, the 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 thirsting and the hungering after what I be studying is like, have we come to that place that we literally just want to just to to just dive into eating the word of God because we see that it is it is that good and we desire it above all things. Amen, Pastor Nick. Hey Amen. I agree. I agree. Right. Exactly what my brother just said. You know, it says, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. He says, and they shall be filled. Amen. It's, it's the seeking after God. It's the seeking after Christ. It is us panting, panting as a deer panted for the rivers of water. So my soul longeth after thee. It's that desire to, to, to want him. And that's where... That's where uh, it's heartbreaking sometimes when we look at what's happening, what's happening in in uh, Western culture as it relates to Christianity. Uh, we're, we're forming it's sad, but we're forming our own version of what Christianity is. And I look at this passage of scripture, Pastor Nate, when he says, I am the bread of life. He's saying that he's our substance. He's saying that he's he's our supply, uh, not the stuff. He's our supply. He's our source. That's what he's saying, because bread symbolizes substance. It, 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 it symbolizes uh, that he will. He's our God is our provider. Uh, in the Old Testament, they called him Jehovah Jireh, our provider. God will provide the word provider is he will supply he he will he will always uh keep us amen he says he never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread god is our substance and so this right here is powerful because he's letting us know we need him we need him we need god uh not for those things but if you seek him you will never have, you'll never be in want. And so even when you look at Psalms 23, which everybody knows, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Right. But, but he talks about that. He's going to be our supplier. God is our supply. And so when we seek him, when we seek him, man, I mean, just him, just him alone. I think, you know what I think of Pastor Nate? I think of people in third world countries that accept Amen. the gospel. I, I look at people over in countries like China who have to have church underground uh, because uh, when I say underground, in hiding, simply because their government is opposed to them and, and will kill them. I look at countries like in South America uh, where where, where they're poor in third world countries. Like, uh, I, I, I never forget, man, um, I was stationed in Italy and it was some African sisters who migrated to Sicily. And um, it, it, it's just sad, but you know what they have? They have the, they used to come and visit my church and they had such a joy for the Lord, even though they was basically living in poverty. poverty. And our church would be a blessing to them. But uh, even in their poverty, uh, in these little African communities that they had over in Sicily, uh, we were still, uh, you would still see the joy of the Lord. And they used to sing these beautiful songs, African songs, uh, 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 um, just glorifying and magnifying God. And, and, and one African lady told me, she said, uh, our country don't have nothing like y'all country, nothing like it. They're having church on on the ground, on the ground in places. But guess what? They still worshiping God. And so it opens up your eyes to a whole nother concept. They still want Jesus. 
And uh, and and, and it, it it breaks my heart sometimes when I look at where where we're going uh, in 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 our Christian faith. It, it's heartbreaking, you know. We're, as a whole, I'm talking about the church as a whole, but we know that you know there's going to be a false church that's going to rise up in these latter days, a lukewarm church. We know that, but and and it's been all through the New Testament. We know that. And so, uh, but, but, you know, the sad part is, man, it's, it's getting worse and worse. And I know it's all setting the stage of the coming of our, of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, Brother Nick, when I was studying these I am's, right, and putting these lessons together, when I looked at the bread of life, um, and I don't know if one of you, I know Key's got his Bible. You got your Bible with you, Nick? Yeah, I have my Bible. I believe in my study and I will stand corrected if this ain't true, but Jesus was fulfilling what Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, verses two and three. And if somebody would read that, it would be amazing because everything that Jesus spoke here in the parable that said, I am the bread of life, is exactly what I, Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, two and three. Amen, amen. And, 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 we, and we have to know uh, that all of these are messianic. Uh, there's a lot in Isaiah is filled with a lot of messianic prophecies. Amen. So uh, Isaiah 52 and what? And three? Isaiah 55 verses 57. two and three. Amen. Amen. Verses two and three. And so it says here, it says, why do you spend, why do you spend, why do you spend for money what is, is not bread? He says, and, and your wages for what does not satisfy. He says, listen, listen carefully to me and eat what is good. He says, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Amen. And then read three. Was that three? Amen. Incline, incline your ears. Okay, I, I didn't read three. Incline your ears to come to me. Hear. And your soul shall 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 live, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercy of David. Amen. 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 I mean, everything Jesus spoke when he said, "I am the bread of life," was was right here in Isaiah, in the old covenant. So they would have recognized this. They would have recognized this because it was in Amen. the Torah. Amen. And, and, and Pastor Nate, oftentimes people really don't understand the times that they were in. Um, the times that that G, the time that Jesus walked on on uh, in Palestine or in this area, uh, these were very hard times. And uh, it, uh, under under Roman oppression, uh, they were being overtaxed. They were being overburdened with with uh, uh with, with um, wages, with work, and they would work a, a lot of hours. They would work tedious hours and sometimes uh, barely barely for nothing. And so the times were very hard. They didn't have a welfare system or a government system to take care of God, uh, uh, you know, people in, the, in these regions. And so these were very, very tedious, hard times for them. And so uh, uh, to have to, this miracle that Jesus did by the feeding of a uh, 5,000 with two fish and five loaves, this miracle spread throughout the region rapidly. Uh, historians say that people began to run rapidly uh, because this was, they followed Jesus, uh, they followed the disciples across the, 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 the sea because uh, uh, the Sea of Galilee, because this was a phenomenal miracle. Feeding 5,000 with two fish and five loaves, this was a miracle upon miracles. And, and to have somebody to give them this manna from heaven, this man, oh, they wanted this bread. They wanted this natural bread. They wanted to feed their bellies. This was, he says, and so Jesus said, you seek after, you're not seeking after me for me. You, you seeking after me because of the bread that you ate. This passage is powerful, and this should be an eye opener for all, for, for especially for those Christians who, who say they really love Christ. This passage should be an eye opener to say to make make sure that we 
do a self-examination and say, am I seeking Jesus for the right reasons? Because whenever we start talking about I'm blessed and I'm blessed and I'm blessed, and we call being blessed uh, uh, having things, we really got it twisted when that's the case. Because uh, I think somebody said it earlier. Suppose you lose everything that you have. Would you still accept Jesus? Would you still say that you're blessed? Powerful question to ask. Amen. Amen. You know, I had a professor tell me once. Well, didn't tell me, but told the whole class, right? He said, you can buy a bed, but you can't buy rest. You can buy a book, but you can't buy wisdom. You can buy entertainment, but you can't buy joy. You can buy leisure, but you can't buy peace. You can buy insurance, but you can't buy that safety. You can buy your way to the top, but you can't buy salvation. See, we can buy things that we think is making us in the contentment. But when it comes down to it, those things will perish, those things will fall away, those things will disappear. The only thing that will be everlasting, the only thing that will be everlasting is the salvation that God gives. And that's through the bread of life, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Powerful. Powerful passage, man. Powerful passage of scripture. I, I, I'm just truly blessed by this. Amen. And 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 I think that's this is one of the things that um that the church definitely needs to hear. That listen, you know, you you gotta you gotta sacrifice it all. You gotta give up it all for the sake of the gospel. Don't come. And, and we have to we have to recognize that in in our witness, you know, of the gospel. And not making Jesus seem like some genie in the sky. Yeah, just come on to God; He'll make it all better. So we we, we come to to know that we preach we preach this message not of a God in need of blessing us with material things, but us in need of God. Jesus is essentially saying, "Listen, I am all there is when it comes to you being able to be saved." Amen. There, I, Amen. I, there, there's there's no other name under heaven by which man might be saved. That I am it. You should look for no more. This is this is all you are gonna get right here. Mm -hmm. and if Amen. I'm not enough, then you know I don't know what to tell you. You know what I'm saying? And basically, we see what happened. The disciples left. Like man, we out of here. We're gone because we mm -hmm. came expecting this, 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 and this. It's like no. No, so many people are, are led to churches and they're hearing these pastors say, oh, if you sow this seed, no, if oh. you in obedience, if you believe that Jesus is Lord, if you lay down your life, we got people who, people who are being persecuted all around the world and, and, and they're captives of telling them, all you got to do is deny Jesus and we'll let you out of this container. You won't be starving no more. We'll give you all the food and drink you want. And then people say, for Christ I live, for Christ I die. Because they see the beauty of who he is. They see the, the, the beauty of the necessity of who Christ is. And it isn't for him to just sustain us on earth. Because we know, hey, we're only here for a short period of time. That's right. To That's sustain right. Sustain us throughout all of eternity. You know, David spoke of that in, in Psalms. Um, David spoke exactly about what Jesus did here in John chapter six, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was Psalm one, one o seven, eight or nine, one o seven verses eight or nine. I'm, I'm thinking it's nine. Um where he's talking about, he says, uh, he satisfies the, uh, the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Isn't this what the bread of life does? Isn't this what Jesus does? Isn't this the fulfillment of these things that were, that, 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 that they were promised has come forth, but yet they couldn't see it. And, and a lot of people today can't see it. Yeah, um, yeah. No. They're look so at, wrapped up in self. Look at this Western culture. 
This Western Amen. culture say, man, you ain't popping if you ain't got this, that, and the other. Yeah. You ain't this. But Jesus say, listen, you are you are in this world, but not of this world. Come from among them. Stop mm -hmm. trying to do. Even we go all the way back to the Old Testament. God was like, listen, don't do what the heathen nation is doing. Don't do. Right. Don't get caught up and distracted by what they doing. Yeah, they look like they got all the freedom in the world. Don't get caught. The same message in the New Testament. Come out from among them. Be ye separated. Mm -hmm. Don't Amen. get caught up. Don't get caught up in that. I look at. Uh, I was reading. Uh, I was. St I started a study this morning on uh, First Corinthians, and he realized that that city was a was a, a a rich city, and the church in that city started to gravitate towards the the paganism mm -hmm. in that in that 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 city. And Paul wrote a letter and he said, "Listen, hold on. What are y'all doing?" Y'all supposed to be the light in the city and said, y'all doing what the city's doing. Y'all doing what these people in the city are doing. How much more so now? We go on social media, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. People are promoting self. Hey, look at me. I'm blessed because I got this, 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 and this. And now people are starting to, you know, so-called believers let covetousness rise up in them and say, man, I so want that. God, look at them. They don't even serve you and look at what they got. Oh, how deceived we may be. And God is like, look, look at the heart. Look at your desires. You coming to me upset. And I was once in that place. I went to God upset. And 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 and, and even uh who who that was? They, that was Paul. Paul said, My foot almost slipped when I seen the righteous uh <laughs> prospering. And my foot almost slipped, like, hold on. I'm doing all, but we have to understand. Satan presented the same thing to Christ. He said, I give you all of this if you would simply bow down and worship me. Jesus understood, like, hold on, wait. The preciousness of, of, of obeying my God, of, of, of obeying my father is far more than what you can give me. You can't give me greater than what my father will give me. Why in the world would I bow down for these measly things when I know that which is stored up for me is eternal? So this is definitely important because people have shipwrecked their faith running after things. You know, and, and Pastor Nick taught on the life and resurrection today, and I think, you know, this goes hand in hand because it, it ties in, brother. Amen. Amen. It, 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 you know, and, and, and I, I say this, that one of the major problems, uh, I've been in construction, I've been an engineer now for 35 years of my life, you know, um, and the hardest thing is to uh, when you when you're rebuilding uh, in your faith, you know, because a lot of times we don't we it's it's hard to build on a foundation that has already been laid, and it's very difficult. It's very difficult. So you look at the last thirty years of Christianity, from TBN to the Word Network to all of these different so-called teachers on uh, on mainstream television. Uh, we're dealing with the children of all of that. Uh, we're dealing with the children of the uh, uh, who who can the Jim Bakers and the Jimmy Swaggers, and we're dealing uh, of the All Roberts. We're dealing uh, with the children of like the Kenneth Copelands and the uh, Jesse Duplantis and the, the the Joyce Myers who believe in just speak it and it comes into existence. All you have to do is speak things and it will manifest. We're dealing with the children. Matter of fact, we're dealing with the children's children of those type of theologies. And, and so now it's like it's on automatic. And so uh, when you look at people, because I had to, and, and I, I share a little bit of my testimony, you have to come to a point where you have to start tearing things down in order, uh, old theologies and, and old ideologies, you have to start tearing those things down. And I, and, and I tell people in construction, 
The hardest thing, the most messy part of construction is demo. It's demo. It's tearing down what 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 you have already what was already built. But in order to build back up on a strong foundation, sometimes you have to tear everything down. All of your so-called theologies, if you know it was wrong, your so-called Christology or your so-called pneumatology or soteriology, sometimes when you have been taught wrong, the best thing to do is, and it's messy, it hurts. It's hurt. It hurts when everything that your mama told you, you find out, dang, man, they were wrong. It hurts. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I've been there. I, 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 I've been... Uh, uh, I've been in ministries. Uh, I came up in the Pentecostal movement. I came up in all of that. Name it, claim it, rebuking the devil and the blood of Jesus is against you. And we're binding the devil up this week and, and we're binding it up and we're going to fast on this and we're going to bind the devil up on that and this and that. And he keeps getting loose and all of this stuff is going on. And after a while, you 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 coming up and next thing you know, you you 10 years in the gospel and you start seeing why are we it, why are we still this ain't going nowhere and, and it, it takes a spiritual mind to see it and 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 you have to start saying wait a minute uh did Jesus do enough on the cross what what are all of these antics that we're doing what are all of these things that we're doing what what is all of this stuff that we we none of this is in scripture preach bro none of slain in the spirit, all of this stuff that people are talking about. And you have to, sometimes you have to just say, wait a minute. I know what I've seen with, with my, I, I've seen this stuff. And so what has to happen, just like in construction, you, and I'm telling you, you have to start knocking the building down, the thing that you had built upon, and you got to get it back to Jesus. You have to get it right back to Jesus. And when you get it back there, He's the foundation of everything. He's the chief cornerstone of everything that you level everything, the walls, you level all the walls off of him. But you got to get down to him. You got to get down to what it's really about, that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ, not of ourselves, but it's a gift of God. And when we can rip it all down and get back down to Jesus, and then we start building upon it through the word of God and with the help of the Holy Spirit. Then we start understanding what God has done for us. And then we can truly worship him in spirit, but not only in spirit, but also in truth. I love to praise God. I, I mean, y'all, y'all, if y'all go on my on my page. Y'all will see, oh, I love praising God. I sing all day. I worship. Oh, Pastor Nate is another one. He worships all day. We love to praise and worship God, but we have to worship and praise God in truth. And so sometimes, and this is the problem in Western culture, we don't know how to get back down to just Jesus because Jesus is enough. And if we can get down to him, Christology, who is he? What did he come to do? And really get a firm foundation in him. Then we can start growing in the things of God. We're talking about all kinds of stuff on social media. Once they, everybody talking about, oh, we, uh, uh, they don't understand eternal security. They don't understand the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're in, we're in, we, we're, we're in terrible times today. We're, we're at terrible times today, and so sometimes what, what's happening is, a uh, uh, Pastor Nate and 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 and, and Pastor and Minister Key, what's happening is, a lot of people don't even know where to start, and they're so brainwashed by 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 the false by by the false. They have heaped up teachers for themselves, and they have itching ears, and this has been going on for the last thirty years. Uh, and, and yes, we had false preachers in the past, but they they didn't they were not the majority. Now we're seeing the broad destruction that's leading to death and narrow. They're calling people who just believe the Bible weird now. They're calling up, and, and guess what? We're, we're few. And, and I tell you, it's sad. And so I, I, I'm praying that people begin to tear this house down, what we see going on today. Because 
I'm afraid to see the kingdom of God in 30 years. I, I probably I'm 50, I'm 54. I don't know where this is going. I, I I went on a live today. This girl was talking about some Leviathan spirits and portals in the in the heavens. I will give you the bread of life. He didn't say, I'll show you the bread of life. He didn't say, I'll help you find the bread of life. He said, I am the bread of life. And if you feed on me, you'll never be hungry or thirst again. It would be folly for a sinful man to utter the words of verse 35, right? No mere man can satisfy his own hunger or his own thirst, much less satisfy the spiritual appetite of the whole world. Who else would say that they themselves are what everybody needs? Has anyone ever spoken someone like this before? Has anyone ever spoken like this before? Did Buddha, did Confucius, maybe Muhammad? No, what they would do is point to someone else or something else. What Jesus did was spectacular, extraordinary, bold, extraordinary. An explanation mark. He pointed to himself. And then he said, I am what you need. And yet, actually is the bread of life. He was born into this world to meet the spiritual need. That a fallen humanity, a fallen mankind was in. In fact, in fact, his very birthplace is significant in this regard. Where was Jesus born? When you see where Jesus was born, his birth fulfilled the great prophecy in the book of Micah. Micah 5.2 says, But you, Bethlehem, Epithrath, Though you are little among thousands, though you are little among thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler of Israel, whose goings forth are from the old, from everlasting. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, now watch this. I want you to pay close attention to something. Bethlehem in Hebrew means house of bread. House of bread. The house of bread would, would bring forth its greatest ever. Never to be repeated again. The best loaf that anybody could ask for. The best loaf that anybody could ask for. So many people bake bread every single week. And they constantly tweak the recipe to try to obtain that perfect loaf. They have a fascination with trying to get the biggest loaf they've ever had. And I can honestly say the more that they tweak that recipe, the worse it gets. The more they try to tweak the recipe that was already perfected, the worse it gets. But 2,000 years ago, 
Bethlehem, the house of bread, brought forth the greatest ever. Never to repeat, be repeated loaf of bread. The bread of life. When Jesus said, I am that bread of life, he was fulfilling what had been spoke of. And like the miracle that Jesus performed, there was a loaf that would be given and multiplied over and over and over in the lives of countless believers throughout the ages, nourishing and filling them repeatedly. But look closer at the claim that he makes. Look closer at the claim that he makes. He says, he who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. He isn't talking about a natural thirst or a natural hunger. He's speaking. He's speaking of the deepest longing of the human need. They'll be completely met by the fulfillment of the bread of life, Jesus Christ. We, what are humanity's deepest needs? It is said that our deepest needs are based on identity, acceptance, security, and purpose. If you look at Ephesians 1 and 6, it really shows you the identity. If you look for security, if you go to Romans 8, 38 and 39, you'll start to see the security that's given. But the purpose the purpose is eternal, caught up in the plan and purpose of the king of the universe. What did he tell us to do? He said, he who comes to me. So what do we do? We come. We did that for salvation, but it's a lifelong coming. We don't ignore him. What relationship can prosper if one party ignores the other? We come in prayer. We come in our quiet time. We come throughout the day as we bring him into our normal lives. We come in humility as we turn our hearts to consider and think about the Lord and His Word once again. He then said, He said, He who believes in me. Jesus said, This is the work that God asked. This is the work that God asked. Believe. This also is not a one and off for salvation. But it is in everything we go through. We believe that He is in it. We believe that He cares. We believe that He cares. We believe that He has a purpose for it. We believe that He wants to teach us. We believe that he's adequate enough in it. We believe. And this is the belief. It's not misplaced, but it's based on the promises he's given us in his word. And he said, give thanks. He said, give thanks. 
in recounting how the bread was multiplied so that all could eat. Verse 23 here tells us that the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. It became known based on the place where Jesus gave thanks, not where the bread was multiplied or the people were filled. It is remembered as the place where Jesus gave thanks. Do you want the bread to be multiplied in your life? Then do likewise give thanks. We try and ultimately fail when it tries to satisfy the spiritual needs with things. But Jesus, but Jesus from the house of bread, from Bethlehem, the house of bread is the special never to be repeated bread of life that truly satisfies. He claimed that he himself could meet the very hunger and the very thirst of every soul. He fills our deepest needs. He nourishes our soul. He gives us our identity. He gives us our security. He gives us our purpose. The very things that humanity needs, God gives because He is the bread of life. Without Him, we're nothing. But he asked us to come and feed on him. Come, believe, and be thankful. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. And Jesus is that word. Jesus says, I am who I am. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He says, come to me. Give thanks with me. Come to communion with me. Fellowship with me. Walk with me. Abide with me. And I will sustain your every need. You will not want. You will not desire for I have given you the bread of life I've given you the purpose I've given you the plan I've given you the security he is that bread of life he is that bread of life he didn't just say let me show you let me let me let me take you let me guide you he said no I am the bread of life Minister King praise God praise God praise God praise God I trust that man that after this 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 life that we would definitely examine ourselves and find out why are we following Christ? Is it is it really for salvation? Is it really out of love? If it is it really out of adoration and worship? Or is it for things? Is it really for things? Because many are frustrated right now. Uh, because they're not getting what they've been praying for and think that they're owed it based upon some misquoting of some scripture that came from some prosperity preacher. We got to really examine the foundation of our faith. Why are we really following Jesus? And may God, you know, through the Holy Spirit and prayer, uh, spell out to us the intents of our hearts. And from whatever he reveals through prayer, that we will, you know, get it right. That we will we will call out to God and ask him to purify our hearts. 
and turn them towards him and not towards the things of this world. May we forsake the things of this world and turn wholeheartedly to Jesus and let him be the fulfillment of the affections that we are to have in this walk and not of the things of this world. So I pray that, you know, we, I think a great foundation was laid today and that we ought to go in and definitely do some more studying on the bread and really examine our hearts and see if we really of the faith. Amen. How you doing, Victor? I guess it's victory. I don't know. I can't read it. How you doing, brother? Victor. What's on your heart, brother? Well, I'd like to say